Right. Yeah, I'll, I'll be getting into that for sure. Uh, so Sounds great. Thanks for the intro, Ben. And uh, thanks for the great presentation, Reg. We got the memo on the orange pants. I don't see any other orange pants here tonight, though. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it's, it's funny. Uh, Reg and I didn't really talk too much about my presentation, but he's got a little Easter egg in his that will come to mind. We'll see if you can find it. Um, so what I'm here to talk about today is equipping Ark's knight in shining armor. So right. I think a lot of times when people think of AI, maybe you don't have that experience with AI, they view AI as going to be the savior, right? Throw my data at it, it's going to solve all my problems. At ERP, we learned really quickly that that wasn't going to be the case. But we learned that, you know, setting up your AI environment in the right environment and giving the right tools and maybe the right sidekicks, you can have a successful program. So for the agenda today, I'm going to do a little bit of background on myself, a little background on ARC resources. Then I'm going to go through a completions data set so you guys have a bit of a background before I go into six case studies. So there's going to be a lot of case studies here. And because there's going to be so many, we'll review those key takeaways from each one of those case studies again. And by the end of it, I'm hoping that you guys are going to be convinced that our AI system is not the Black Knight from Monty Python who just didn't know when to give up, lost every limb until he's just sitting there as a torso. But we're actually the Dark Knight, you know, saving Gotham on a regular basis. So I'm a born and bred Calgarian. I'm a husband. If you guys are uh, intimate with the insights personalities, I'm a cool blue. So give me all the data you want, but give me time to analyze it. I graduated from the University of Victoria with the Bachelor's of Engineering in, Me in Mechanical. I have a minor in economics. I started with ARC right out of school, and I've been lucky enough to be part of four teams with them. And all of them, I found lots of value in data analytics. And that kind of led me to seeking out a more specific role, and I was lucky enough to get that opportunity with our data analytics team now. If you're looking for an icebreaker with me later on, you can ask how I've added data analytics to each one of these interests, my three Bs, basketball, bikes, beer, and I fell victim to Drive to Survive. Now I'm an F1 addict. But uh, I, was, I, I did a dry run of this at ARC, and they said, you really should put a fourth B in there, and that should have been Batman. But I'm not really that big of a Batman fan, so if there is any hardcore Batman fans out here, this is an early apology for any references that might not go perfect. So ARC Resources, we're uh, currently Canada's third largest natural gas producer and the largest condensate producer. We were established in 1996, and we're, we're currently grown to be about a $12 billion company. Uh, we have about 850 employees. That's spread between our Calgary office we also have an office in Grand Prairie and an office in Dawson Creek. So our data team consists of four separate teams in there. We have enablement and reporting, we have corporate data, we have an operations data team, and then we have a data science team. Each one of these teams has about three to four permanent employees at ARC, and then we use quite a few contractors to help balance out the workload there. They all report to our one manager of data analytics, who will then report to our VP of Capital Operations, who reports to our Chief Operations Officer. So our data science group is really enmeshed with our operations and our development team. So we're really part of the business. But we do have that corporate data side, more working with the, corporate, uh, with the accounting side and whatnot. Our data stack is uh, Microsoft Azure's our cloud provider. Most of our tools and uh, manipulating that data is in that uh, service or in Databricks. Our analysts are typically using Power BI or Tipco Spotfire. And of course, we have a lot of people still using the classic Excel. So that's background on the company. Now we're going to jump into completions. And I'm pretty positive there's not a ton of completion experts here. But I'm going to try to give you enough background that you at least can follow these case studies we have. So it's a bit of a complicated process, but it lives in the middle of our well's life cycle. So the first thing we got to do for a well is, of course, drill it. And then with that, we have a well bore now in that rock formation we want. The next piece we do is the completions piece, which is going to take two to seven days. And the whole idea of that is we're trying to connect the rock formation to that well bore we just drilled. Now, arcs, most of our lands is what we call in an unconventional rock. And what that really means is our oil and gas doesn't actually flow freely through that rock. So we have to create pathways for that. And that's really a big part of completions for our team. So to create those pathways, 
we actually create enough pressure in that rock to break it apart. And then we have to place sand to keep those fractures open. And that then gives enough room for those oil and gas molecules to actually travel through the rock into our well bore. After that's done, we can hand it over to our production team. And that well is going to produce somewhere between 10 to 30 years until it's no longer economical to produce it. At which point we'll abandon the well and then we'll try to return the land back to its original status. So the first thing we have to do with completions is we've got to move that equipment there. And so we hire a service provider who provides that equipment and they run it for us. Now almost every piece of equipment on here has some sort of sensor on there that's going to tell some story of what's going on. So the service company actually aggregates all this service data, all this data for us and gives it to us in a single file. Or we have a number of ways to do it and it will change each one's, but the big thing is they'll aggregate that data for us and give it to us. But for uh, the case studies I'm going to show today here, there's a lot of equipment on this site, but I'm going to just show you the four you need to know. So the first one you need to know is we got a sandbox. Again, we need that sand that's going to hold the rock fractures open. So we have sand storage here. The next thing we have is water. So we're going to need that water storage. And what that does is that transfers that pressure at surface to the rock so we can frac fracture it but it also helps move that sand down the well bore into that fracture phase. The third piece of equipment is a blender, and that actually mixes the sand with the water into that mixture so we can actually move it downhole, which we move through these groups of trucks, which all have these big pumps on them. And those pumps connect to the blender, which then connects to our wellhead, and then we move it down. So now we got that equipment on site, it's all rigged in, the next thing we need to do is create that connection from the well bore to the rock. So we create some sort of hole in that well bore to allow that path of that water to then fill. There's a lot of methods to do that, but we're not going to cover that in this presentation. So this is the typical data we see. And we do what we call, we split the well into stages. And each stage can take around that 60 to 120 minutes. And each one of these, uh, Data lines is, you know, a few of the ones we've seen, but the ones you need to focus on for this case study. So I'm going to go through each one of these and, holy, and hopefully show in this little cartoon what actually is going on and hopefully make it easy for you guys to understand. So to start off with in this blue square is we fill that well bore with the water. And once that well bore is filled with water, we can keep increasing that pressure until we have that rock failure and we get these fractures created here. So this red line is our pressure of our surface, the blue line is our water, and how fastly it's being pumped through there. Once we've created those fractures, now we can start placing that sand. And so what we take now is we have that water that we're still pumping, of course, and now we have our sand and our water ratio. And that's what's being measured by this yellow line here. And that's being put through our blender. So it all starts at surface, and then you can see it slowly moving down hole. We have another measure that's calculated, which is what that sand concentration is once it reaches the bottom hole formation, which is depicted in this green line. So the one thing to notice is we do increase this concentration of sand as we move on through the stage. As that fracture gets more developed, we can put sand in there quicker. And of course, the quicker we can do this, the more economical these fracks can come which then, of course, will make ARC more money in the long term. So once all the sand's been placed, we've frac opened, we've propped those fractures as much as we can. We'll then cut sand, and we'll begin flushing the well bore with water. So you can see the yellow line stop now, and now we have that green line still remaining here in the data. Once we've flushed all that sand out of the well bore, we now have a clean well bore. And that's important because we need, a piece of, we need to run a piece of equipment into that well bore that now isolates this stage and we can now create new holes for the next stage so we can complete that. Now you'll notice we have more fractures here, or more holes I should say, to create more fractures. And the whole idea to that is we're trying to create this balance of we want to treat as many fractures as possible because we want to make this as economical as possible. So we repeat that same process and we get another set of data. Now what you'll see is in this stage, all these fractures are the perfect length. And in an ideal world, that would be the case, but that's not reality, of course. 
And we actually don't know how all these fractures are growing. It's a bit of a black box down there, and the joke is it's a deep, dark hole that really no one knows what's going down. So where data analytics comes into this is understanding these charts and trying to make inferences to see what's actually going on down hole. So in this case, you know, this fracture is quite a bit smaller, and that sand that we would have pumped was the same amount of sand that we would have pumped in this stage, but instead of going into this one fracture, it decided to go into this fracture. And we don't want this to happen because we only own so much area that we can actually contact this rock. So if this area of fracture doesn't grow, we haven't created a pathway for that oil and that gas to travel into that area. So we're not being as efficient with this well. So another thing that might happen, which I'm showing in this next stage, is we might actually not in even initiate a fracture. And that's a whole other piece. And there, as the rock changes, that's a, some rock is harder to frack than others. So that's something else we have to be aware of. So this stage, you know, is a bit better, you know, a better target, and we're trying to, you know, we'd be happy with that. So again, just trying to show there's a range of values. But now in this next stage, that piece of equipment we use to isolate can actually fail. So now all that sand we were going to pump into these holes have actually went into that previous stage, and you can now see we've overcompensated, and we have much larger fractures in that stage and then we didn't create any fractures in this stage that we wanted here. And then we can finish it off. So again, this is an example well where we have seven stages. We now have seven unique sets of this time series data, each one taking 20 to 60, I mean 60 to two hours. Um, so yeah, the big thing is, can we understand from this surface data what's actually going on downhole? And we do have some, sorry, before I get onto that. And then once we're done fracturing, we have to remove all that isolation equipment. We then add some other equipment into that wool bore to help produce it. So I mentioned it was a deep dark hole, but we do have some ways that we can add data to actually get some understandings there. So one of the things we can do is we can actually run a fiber optic cable while we drill that well bore and place that along. And that fiber optic cable is allowed to give us an acoustic measurement at long depths of long that whole fiber optic cable. So where we create holes in that well bore, we now can see an acoustic signature that we can, that is a measurement of how that water that we're putting in and that sand is creating that noise. The other thing we get from it is also temperature. So with that temperature, again, the cold water we're pumping at surface, we're now pumping into the warm rock. And so we see that cooling. And then when that fracture is no longer taking fluid, it will now start to warm back up. But this is expensive. So ARC currently has about seven wells that has this data across 15, across, uh, since 2015. And to put that in perspective, last year ARC drilled 122 wells. So it's a very small sample size to the grand scheme of things. But there's another data set we can use. And funny enough, Ben's dad actually works for a company that does this. Uh, but it's, we do downhole imaging, actually. So what we can do is those holes we make in the casing we actually had an idea what those holes start out with in size. And after we're done fracking and we remove all that isolation equipment, we can run what is like a camera down there. And from that, we actually take images of all those holes. And those holes are eroding with that water and sand we pump through. So depending on how big those holes are, we can make an inference of how much water and sand went through there. Now, this is a lot cheaper for us to do. Uh, we've been doing this kind of grabbing this data set since uh, 2019 now and we have 35 wells. So it's you know, a lot more something we can train on and get a better idea on. So that's the background you need, and now we can jump into the case study. So I'm going to go through the six projects here of you know, when we started as a young Bruce Wayne, motivated to get the revenge and murder of his parents, but you know, probably a bit naive still. And then you know, hopefully moving towards this part where it's, we're part of the, you know, a dark night who's uh, saving ARC on a regular basis with data problems we're trying to solve. So in 2019, we started that pilot project. It started with a manager of data analytics and an internal data scientist. And I was actually one of the subject matter experts in the first project we took on. So in this first project, we wanted to leverage that fiber data we had. We had it on seven wells. We wanted to apply learnings from it to the rest of our well set. So what we did was 
we looked at that acoustic data and we labeled those events where we saw that the acoustics stopped, right? That fracture stopped growing. And we wanted to, so we went through what we had at the time, which was four wells, and labeled all those events that happened. We then, uh, it ended up being four wells and 550,000 rows of data, about eight, 80 stages. So those stages of data showing we had 80 of those. We partnered with an IT consulting firm. They gave us a data scientist and a data engineer. And we started to iterate on some models. One of the first iterations we did was we uh, did a classic train test split, of course. But we actually did that randomly across the rows. And we had a lot of trouble with overfitting, right? There's some data leakage that was happening. And the model was, yeah, just overfit too much. So what we did then was we trained on three of the wells that we had data for and then tested on that fourth well. And this kind of mimics what we'd be doing in real life, right? We'd be using this fiber data on a well that wouldn't have that fiber, any fiber data. So it's, it's a bit more of that true reality. Unfortunately, the results were terrible and we couldn't actually get any good results from it. So then our next iteration is we had those 80 stages. We now trained the model on 79 and then tested on that one stage. And we did that 79 times and we saw what that accuracy was for each one of those stages. We saw the accuracy was a lot better, which was good, but obviously not a usable model because we were only training on wells that actually already had this data, uh, or testing on wells that actually had this data already, and it was only going to apply to those wells. So what did it tell us? It told us we needed more data. But, where, but we also got value from this project was now we didn't have any database for this completion structure to start off with. So with, when we were working with this consulting data engineer, we let her know it, we wanted it to be a repeatable process. We wanted to make sure that we could leverage this work in the future if we needed to. But the big learning here was we were a young Bruce Wayne and we are trying to take on the big bad villain of Bane, right? He's too strong, he's gonna break our back uh, and we weren't quite ready for it. So this led us into our second project. Again, the biggest learning was we didn't have enough data. So one of the observations, and you guys might have noticed this, but on that event where the acoustic stopped, on that surface data, you could actually see that there was an anomaly that was detected there. And that was something we saw with a lot of those events we tested, that we saw some sort of pressure anomaly. So now what we did is we grabbed a random set of six wells on a pad, and instead of labeling that acoustic data, we labeled this pressure data. So again, now we're only using the data that we have for all of our wells, and we're going to be able to get that much larger data set. We were able to use the same IT consultants we had for that first project, and so we went ahead and followed actually a very similar process to what they did. So this, again, we started where we left off, where we trained five wells and then tested on that sixth well, and our results were much better. But then when we tried it on a seventh well that was just not much further away but wasn't on the same Area, exact area as the wells we trained on, the model fell apart again. So again, telling us, you know, we're on to something, but we don't exactly have enough data. And that the model, you know, was needed to be very specific to that area. The other thing we learned from this is the model was actually only able to predict 20 seconds before the event was gonna happen. And if you remember, any of those changes we make at surface take some time to actually get down hole. It would take anywhere between two to five minutes. So we learned that in that 20 seconds, we actually couldn't be reactive to what the model would tell us. So we had to focus on more being proactive for these problems. Uh, the other big thing we learned was on when we did feature importance for the model that we saw value for. And when we did that feature importance, we saw that sand was actually one of the highest features that was ranked in a number of different features we created which was a good sign because sand is something we had control over. So the big learning from that and my Batman reference was we need a database. At this point, we need the wisdom. We need someone who's been around Gotham for a while, under knows how, un, knows how the crime works. So we need that Alfred. We need that Alfred Pennyworth who's going to manage your systems and also create that bat cave for us, right? Really be that administrator. And so that led us into uh, 2019, ingesting all of our data, frac data, back from 2016. So it was a big project, uh, but we have found a ton of values from it. And we were also able, again, to look at that first project 
and reuse a lot of that same uh, code that was written by that data engineer as a template for when we were creating our database. So at this point, we failed on two Bain problems. We're now working on our database. The next thing we did was we decided to partner with somebody else, another superhero, let's say, like Catwoman. So we partnered with actually an industry service company, somebody who also does that fracturing, but has a different lens on it. And we provided our fiber data. So this is a data set they're not privy to. They don't own wells. They're just pumping these fractures. So this is something that was valuable for them to see. And what they were hoping to have was a model that they could create, but that they could also commercialize. And what we got out of it was some free data scientist work. And so instead of now trying to predict events, we created a feature to measure that frac quality. So this frac quality metric I'm showing is a one would be every fracture has even noise if we were looking at it on the, fa on the, on the fiber side or are growing in the same length. So this would be a one situation. And a zero would be of all those fractures, all your noise is actually only occurring into one of those. So it's a quality metric. And now we can now do this that is actually following our time series. So we're trying to do now a regression on our time series rather than to detect those events. We also took the learnings from our first two projects that we knew the design of experimentation was going to be important here. That we didn't want to provide all that data and end up with an overfit model with something that we actually didn't have much for eyes on the background with. So what we ended up doing was holding back some of the data from the service company so that we could do our own unbiased evaluation of their model. And as you can see, what I'm trying to show here is it's a good thing we did that. So the top stage is a provided stage that we gave for training. The blue is the actual data from that fiber data, and the orange is what the model predicted, which is pretty good accuracy. I think we could all agree that there's some value in this. But then when we took, applied that same model to the low stage, now the red line's the actual, and the blue line's the model prediction. You can see that our error has gone up quite a bit, and we didn't have quite the same amount of value. So again, we've realized we're dealing with a Bain problem still we're not quite ready for. But the nice thing about this is we were able to finally put this project to bed to realize we were out of our league when that service company talked to another company like ARC who had a similar data set, and they let that company train their model on their fiber data as well, and then we were allowed to, and then they then provided the predictions afterwards on that model, and we saw no improvement. So this time now we're seeing that additional data was not actually improving their model predictions at all. So at this point now, we're going back to the Monty Python. We're kind of realizing we're the Black Knight, right? We've lost a few limbs, and we, you know, cut our, we cut our losses at this point and realized, you know, there's just too much. Uh, we don't want to lose our legs. We've lost our arms already. But the big thing was, you know, we partnered with Catwoman, and we got some more visibility from a different lens that on this project that we can move on. So after we've done this, Again, we've had a few Bain problems. We've realized, okay, we need to simplify our problems. We need to move on to the next piece. So we ended up getting together with another IT consulting firm. This time we had two data scientists and two data engineers. And now our database is finished. So we have our Alfred. We got all that data that we had, uh, I think we had, uh, what was it, 500 wells, uh, like 7,000 st stages to now train on. So we got a much bigger data set compared to the six walls we were working on before. And so what we did was we came this time with a number of pro simpler problems. So we actually had four problems. And for each one of those problems, we spent one sprint on them each. And if we didn't see any traction on that after that sprint, we just cut our losses and moved on to the next one. So how did we simplify the problems? So the first thing we did was we just started looking at specific sections of that stage rather than trying to take that whole stage into consideration. So we considered just when that fracture was growing before we started introduce sand into the system. We then also looked at only when sand first hit the rock and how we would see the reactions there. And then the final piece was we were looking at that sand schedule. And our first idea here was we wanted to cluster these data trends over the time series to see if any similar trends could then match some of that uh, data that we had from our advanced diagnostics of the fiber or the downhole imaging. And what we found out was the wells, the 
data we were looking at where we were still looking from responses on the wells were still really difficult. There was some data we were missing there. But where we ended up getting traction was actually when we were looking at the sand data. So in this bottom plot here, I'm showing all of those different sand schedules we've had across those 7,000 stages at the time. And even from like the human eye, we can see the density that there's some patterns developing here. And so the model was able to get some good traction here of clustering these groups together. But what we learned was the best features here were actually not ones that were in libraries for typical time series clustering, but it one, were ones that would mimic our subject matters of how they were actually analyzing it. So we talked to the subject matters, asked them how, were you, how would you compare, say these two SAN schedules were the same? And from that we developed some features and that provided us our best uh, results. The other thing we found we had difficulty with this was actually picking out which model was best. So we had about 1,500 plus models as we were changing the amount of different cluster size because we weren't, didn't know how many clusters were going to exist in this historical data. So, and you know the typical silhouette scores or those libraries of how you would typically grade silhouettes or grade clusters just wasn't providing value. It didn't make much sense to our subject matter experts. So we moved from an unsupervised problem to actually what we call a semi-supervised problem. So we got those subject matter experts to actually make their own clusters of how they would cluster about 200 stages. And then from that, we were able to then see that, uh, compare those models, and we were actually able to now calculate an F1 score, which made picking that final model a lot easier. So our final result from this looks something like this where now we have a number of stages and we're able to say, hey, we did the same thing with the sand on that stage than we had to done previously. And this created a lot of value of just labeling our data set. Because now we can look at some of that historical data and say, okay, in this situation, what sand schedules did I use? And now instead of like using AI, we just have some KPIs to say, okay, with these sand schedules, which KPI did that sand schedule do best at? So again, we learned that simplicity here was key. Um, and the Batman metaphor for this is Robin. So not only did we test you know, a bunch of different uh, models and different ideas that we were trying to solve, but we were working with a number of data scientists and a number of data engineers, and we had a data scientist who actually really excelled with us. So instead of now working with another superhero, we brought a sidekick in with us who's working in our environment and in our bat cave and who's aligned on the same goals as us. And so because of that and his value, we made sure we kept him on board. And the other data scientists didn't really catch on as well. So now we were just focusing with this one who was working well with us. For this next project, uh, we did a similar thing where we had a number of projects that we tried. We spent a sprint to see what would work. But I'm gonna focus on one that aligned again. So this one again, we learned from our past ones is less focused on a specific section of area. But now instead of trying to look at data trends, we're looking at aggregating over this data time. So we picked this area about right when the fracture is being created to right when sand first hits. And we, we wanted to aggregate this to one single number and create a regression off that. And we had, had a special feature that we had learned from some of our previous projects that had gained a lot of traction across our group that has been actually a, a, a big feature for just general learning for us. And so what I have plotted here is that feature that we were trying to train on that we were aggregating. So we were taking the P10 as a minimum and we did P10 just so that removes any outliers of some anomalous data points that might drop. But what typically happens with an engineer, so each one of these lines is a stage on, on a well. And you know, one that sticks out right now is this purple one, it's quite a bit lower. And as a completions engineer, you see this and you wonder, hey, is this normal? Or is something going wrong here? But we didn't have the perspective of doing that with our data set. It wasn't a question we could answer easily without, without pulling up each stage and looking at that data. So what we created was instead of trying to actually predict this, we created a regression that would now take in consideration or 7,000 stages we have in our database and kind of tell you what was normal. So with this regression, uh, 
we were able to say, okay, in these scenarios, what percentage of our wells would be above or below a number? So we, we calculated from a P90 all the way to a P10. And to give you exactly idea what those numbers would be, and we're actually injecting all that fluid and sand into the next stage. So now we have this model that engineers are actually acting on as we're completing. So we're seeing this data live. We have a recommendations of where you've been historically. If you're outside of that, you should take action. So in this situation where you know we might not have initiated some fractures, we'll actually stop the frack and we'll actually run back in hole and create some more holes. In this situation where we have a piece of equipment that failed, we can now stop and rerun a new piece of equipment and deal with that failure. So again, increasing uh, the simplicity, uh, being able to uh, use our sidekick to help us out and get this going quicker led to a quicker turnaround time. Uh, and then using that advanced data still. We saw value that increased uh, confidence in our decision making and we were actually able to act on it. And then of course, again, we were able to review the feature importance with this and saw at sometimes what materials work better than others. But the main Batman metaphor now to this is we created another simple tool, right? We're not trying to defeat Bane by ourselves. We're creating now these little simple tools to now take on that bigger villain. So we have two simple tools in our tool, tool belt now, and our company actually ended up going through a merger at this time, and the merger was actually with a company who was the same size as of us already, which led to a great thing of a lot more data. And now we've proven the value of the database, we have some models that are working with it, that it made sense to grab their historical data and now add it to our database as well. And then also what else came with that was new service companies, and creating those pipelines so that we could now collect the data as it came in as well. And then once that new data comes in, now we need to update our models. And that brings us to our sixth project. So what did we do? Well, we re, we, now we're doing this internally, actually. So luckily, Robin, he was valuable. He moved on. He ended up getting another gig with another company. But because at, when he was a consultant, he was working in our environment and with us, is that we actually knew that code base. And so it was pretty easy for us to pick it up and update that training. And so we're doing this now with the new data we received in the merger. But during that time, our completion engineers actually had a bunch of new techniques and new materials they used. And while we were using this model, we were finding out that there was actually little pieces that we didn't capture when we initially trained it. Because sometimes some of that historical data didn't have that variance. And we were changing new things and so the model hadn't seen some of these new techniques. So we were allowed to, so then at this point, we've also improved some of the features we're putting in to adapt for that. And we also improved some of our pipelines as well to make this data e more easily accessible. And now we have a few, now before we, those predictions would go and they were actually living in a flat file somewhere. But now at this point, we've now changed so those predictions are now living in our database, which was creating a valuable feature when we were able to look at our actuals at that delta. And we were able to do some aggregate analysis based on that. But just to highlight kind of what I've been sharing here, so this was our original model. You can see it was quite a basic model, straight lines. And this was actually one of the wells we had done uh, soon after the merger, but was actually in our original data set. So you can see everything looks pretty good. And if the data is within the middle of these lines, that's telling you it's pretty normal to what you've seen historically. But if it's on the lower side again, we knew there was failures. And that's why you might see some jaggedness here. As we drop below this red line, we realized we needed to run a new plug or something like that. But then when we ran one of those, some of the advanced diagnostics on this well after we finished completing, we did that imaging and we saw that we actually had equipment failures that we didn't notice. So now our model didn't inform us the way we wanted. So we missed it. So if we, hadn't, if we would have had a better way to monitor this and get the signal, that, hey, this model's falling out of date, then we could have caught this sooner. But it was only triggered because we added that new data from our merger that we knew we needed to merge this. So you can see once we retrain that model, that those values that were once in the middle of our prediction is now on the lower end. And again, that matched up with our advanced diagnostics. So the learning here is you need that bat signal. 
right? We need people monitoring when things aren't going right. We need that Gotham police force ready to notify Batman, hey, you gotta change something at this time. So I covered a lot of stuff in that, you know, over the last three years that we've done in six quick slides. So I think it's about time that we uh, maybe do a bit of a recap. So the first thing is you gotta realize when you've taken on a problem that's too big for you with your current conditions. You gotta avoid those Bane problems. So as a group, what we've done now is uh, when we take an intake and opportunity from the business, we give it a benefit and ease score. And we see, you know, is, and that helps us prioritize, are we quite ready for this project yet or not? We also highlight dependent projects. So again, is there other projects we can add to our tool belt before we take on this villain that is gonna be more valuable to us? We've seen a ton of value in having a data set. So not only was it value in the models, but it also provided a lot of uh, value in our analysis. So at ARC now, we do a lot of POCs where we'll do those small sections like we did in project one and two. If we start seeing traction, we know it's now time to spend that development money to create that larger data set because that's gonna pay dividends in the long end. We leverage partnerships with groups trying to solve similar problems. So, you know, finding that Catwoman when you have a problem that Catwoman's gonna be able to help out with. And so example with this is when we take in those opportunities, we also look out there in the market of what's available. Development's expensive, we, we've re realized that. Is there somebody else who's doing it already better? Example, a chatta, if we're trying to look for some uh, natural language querying. Uh, leverage partnerships with people who are willing to work with your environment. Finding that Robin who's gonna be helpful. So you don't always have to have data scientists in-house to solve your problems. Working with consultants groups are a great way to do that, but you wanna hold on to them. And also we've been working with service companies who are willing to work within our environment as well and take on those projects. Again, there's lots of value in simple tools for finding those larger problems. So build up that utility belt Try to get good traction on tools that are simple. You're going to give a lot more value in the long run than just trying to solve that villain without any tools. And then lastly, we need to monitor when things need, when we need help. So we need a bat signal. We need to be able to monitor, monitor that model drift and that data drift. So that's something that we're really focusing now on our ML ops is when triggering when something's not lining up right anymore and we need to go back to the training board. So yeah, that's, uh, I hope I didn't butcher any Batman metaphors too bad, but I, I think I did an okay job. It was a lot of fun making this presentation and I hope you guys had some good takeaways. I'm uh, open for some questions. It's a good question. We put a lot of time of collecting the data we have right now. And I think the one thing we're realizing as a company is we're not exploiting the data we have as much as we could be. So there's a lot of unlocked value still in our data that we haven't been able to, yeah, totally, yeah. But that's part of that, doing that whole POC process is, okay, we don't have the right data here, but can we find it? And then, if, and then add that little bit of data set. Do we see value in adding it? And then go into that bigger piece of trying to find more. Yeah, there's, we look at a lot more data. I just really tried to simplify it today, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, like, and that was one of, the, one of the first learnings was those first few projects is we were really just trying to use our completions data set. But with, in ARC now, we've built up a lot more of our other data sets. So we put a lot of work with our geoscience team and some of the interpretations they've done. And now we're trying to apply that to our learnings. The other big one is drilling data, especially when it comes to completions, right? they're drilling that well and they're having interaction with that rock we're trying to fracture into. And all that drilling data is giving you some kind of feedback of what that rock's like. So we're exploring that too. And so yeah, that's where the small section of completions is one, but we have a much bigger focus of trying to tie all that data together. Are you gonna copy the Yeah, you bet. Yeah, we got a project with Payson right now where our original project we're streaming one of their competitors' data where we're seeing that data live and now we're adding pace on into that now too. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, uh, yeah, it's an interesting uh, dynamic there. So some data, if we see value bringing it in live, we do. So the drilling data, we do. The completion data, we ingest it after the stage is completed. So we've created an automated pipeline that it picks it up after it's done.
but we do have like a go to share screen where we're seeing that data live from our service provider, but it doesn't actually get into our system until that stage is finished. Yeah, so with that, uh, that one regression model we created, is we actually have, we create a roadmap now that we provide to our service company that says, hey, if, you, if you're below or above this number on this stage, you need to phone an ARC individual because we need to make a call if we need to change this. The ARC individual can then look at the screen, review it, and then make that, that change if he's gonna stop rerun a new piece of equipment. Yeah, yeah, so it, like on that case it would be, you know, that model was a regression model on our, all our historical data. So if our new model, if the new data that's coming in is distribution is way different than our that historical one for those actuals, then that's kind of tipping us off that, hey, we're in a new region here. Or if we're constantly having that piece uh, wrong. Uh, it is a bit more on some of our other data sets where we're applying a bit more of that. And we're, we're doing it through ML flow where uh, we're setting those metrics that are, are triggering us when you know, you're, the data we're seeing now is different from the data you had modeled, or your predictions are consistently, you're having your different R squares, like you're having that trigger that your R square is way off now on that piece. Yeah, I got one, uh, I got one thing to say that, and it's show me the money, right? Like they wanna see the value from these models. So that's, that's a big part of my job is, you know, once we create these models is we have to now measure value of when we're, that we're actually doing it. So that was a nice thing about a lot, a lot of these completion focused ones was we were seeing real savings in the time it was taking us to complete those fractures with some of the learnings we were having. So we had those real savings. Now the tough thing in oil and gas is that fr making sure all your fracks are even length that's a lot harder thing to prove. And it, you know, it could take years to actually see the dividends of that work. So it's, it is, you need a, a management group that's bought in that you're seeing results here. But also having those advanced diagnostics like the downhole imaging to say, hey, all my holes are actually a lot more equal is a lot better, easier way to verify that you are doing better work. Yeah, again, a very hard thing and I think this is one of the interesting things we're doing where there's a lot of uncertainty in oil and gas, right? There's a lot of unknowns, especially when it comes into rock data, what you're drilling into. And so that's where, you know, having a regression model where you're, you're embracing that, those bands of uncertainty kind of help out. Uh, we're working on some models that help give us an idea of what production we should expect. And with that, there's features in there, right, that will we can now look at like a SHAP plot to define what's going on there. It's nothing that like has too much traction, but it's like on the roadmap. Again, it's, it might be like one of those Bain problems, right? Where it's, it's a bit much, let's try to tackle some smaller things and then eventually get to some better ideas there. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, again, it's all these like little steps to kind of reach that target, right? Trying to get all these little tools in that tool belt. Um, but I think with each one of these, it's like we solve a, let's say we're able to, to get a metric that gives us an idea of, of what our frac quality is on a stage. Now that's a, now another feature that you plug into your ML model that's trying to predict production. And now you're getting a value of what that frac quality measure is. So it's, it's really interesting. We've had a lot of success lately of just making these little data engineering features and finding value in the long term in some ML models with that. The, the drilling contractors, yeah, so uh, there's something called an EDR, which is a, yeah, yeah, so we're, getting, we're streaming that live into our data lake right now, yeah. No problem. And when I say live, I mean like one to two minute delay. Live enough for me. Yeah, you're getting a bit out of my wheelhouse now. Uh, we, we don't have too much right now on the live prediction. So uh, some of the models I showed here are actually fairly simple, like almost like linear regression, right? Where you, we have inputs that the engineers can put in ahead of time. And then that's actually, they're able to get that prediction before we even start fracturing. But now we also have that we're picking up those inputs from our data lake. And so if something changes from your planning stage to your actual stage, now that prediction is being updated at that point. Uh, the one we, that one sand schedule, schedule clustering one we did, 
yeah, that was going through our Databricks environment where then be ran through uh, that workbook and that SAN cluster was then saved into another stage, into another table with the label that then we were able to connect with the rest of them. But yeah, everything's going through Databricks and PySpark. Yeah, yeah that's, uh, that's putting me back a bit. And uh, yeah, I can't answer that question. I can follow up with you. We, I did a presentation on that with a data scientist who was really involved at uh, the SP Data Workshop last year. So uh, yeah, I'll, I'll dig that up for you then. Yeah, yeah go ahead. How we funded like ARC resources in the very beginning in 1996? Yeah, so uh, ARC Resources was a spin-off from uh, ARC Financial. And so they're, uh, they're kind of like a seeding type company. And we, so we were started off as an energy trust. And uh, so we were, yeah, kind of a, a, a place people could put their money and really get like that dividend payout right away. Eventually the Alberta government made it that energy trust could not exist anymore. I'm no, not an expert in this. But we have since separated from ARC Financial, and now we are our own entity at this point. Sure. Yeah. So, so this is a, a custom ARC feature that we came up with. We're, we're pretty proud of it. But it, it really what it does is it relates the pressure to the rate we're pumping. And so there's a lot of physics that goes into that, but there's a lot of complications that are unknown. So we did some experimentation and some iteration to determine this feature. And so this was one of the features we actually came up with I can't remember if it was in project one or project two, but just this feature alone has provided a ton of value to our engineers and also a ton of value now to a number of ML models. Um, so yeah, this is, this is really just helps normalize your pressure by your rate. And it's not a straightforward concept because you have pipe friction there, you have your holes that you're pumping through, you have your sand, you have different chemicals you're using, which have polymers in the water, which helps reduce your friction. So there's a lot of moving parts to that. So it's, it's yeah, one of those engineered features that we found value from. Um, and so really just looking at that P10 gave us a, you know, what is the lowest value we expect in this? And we focused on this part of time because we know once we add sand to that system, erosion, it creates a ton of uncertainties and it's very hard to model. So this was a section of the, of the stage where the system was a lot more constant and a lot more predictable because that uncertainty of erosion hadn't been introduced yet. So if I can... Yeah, yeah and, and the big thing, right, is getting confidence of when you're out of that bounds is then looking at that fiber or that imaging data that then confirms that you're there, right? And that was the big part to success in this model. But just, just even seeing what's normal based on all your historical data, considering all the features you put into that model has a ton of value for us. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So yeah, this, this feature in the top graph is actually a current one that we're yeah, doing a ton of cross plots with our geo features to try to see if there's a correlation there. Yeah. Yeah, so flowback data wasn't something I covered here, but yeah, that is definitely data we collect and capture as well. So once we're done these wells and we put all that water and that sand down there, we, we have to, clear out all that water so that oil and gas can actually start entering that well bore. And that's something else we measure at the wellhead. So uh, yeah, we haven't worked with it too much just because the value in looking at that flowback data isn't as, the cost of fracturing is so high that every little second we can optimize on that is good cost savings. Yeah, it's, uh, now I'm more in the data analytics space. I would say I'm, I'm starting to get out of touch with industry a bit. Uh, but there's lots of industry pieces going around. I, I would say ARC has been a lot more focused on the completions data set by a lot of people, but there's a lot of companies out there who are doing similar work. I know uh, Birchcliff is one that has some really cool models, and they're at a, they're at a point where uh, they're uh, meshing a lot of that geo data with their completion data as well. And then the big ones like Suncor and Synovus, they, they have huge data science teams. Uh, and they're doing a lot of work, but I know they, you know, they have bigger projects that are more important to them. Where uh, at ARC, we are so focused in Montney, which is so dependent on fracturing rock, that that's been a big focus for us.